Uh, welcome, everyone. So this is uh, our next version of the IMC 60 talk, and this is the alumni talk. So we actually bring our alumni who are well established and done very good research in different areas of physics. And today we have Narayan with us. He just got a faculty position in IIT Kanpur, and he's doing some very good work in perturbative QCD. And I will request Professor Ravindran to introduce him. Because he is um, also, we try to bring their advisors to introduce. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, that the positive aspects of him or not negative aspects. Of him. <laughs> okay, glad. I'm really glad to have uh, <coughs> Narayan with us actually for this uh, you know, 60 years of IMSC. And uh, as you all know, Narayan graduated from here uh, sometime in 2016. 16. And then he moved to Germany to do his first postdoc in, in a very reputed place, uh, Daisy. And then after that, uh, after that he moved to Milan and uh, spent again two to three years over there. Then he got a permanent position in Kanpur. And I to his credit, uh, there are several interesting papers. And some of them were very well-known uh, paper in the field of uh, you know, quantum chromodynamics, and he is one of the, I would say, world experts in uh, computing, uh, you know, multi-loops, multi-leg processes uh, that are relevant for LHC physics. Today, he will probably review some of the things in addition to uh, explaining what he has been doing and his recent works. So I again welcome uh, Narayan for this for this uh, colloquium. And, uh, Thank you very much. It's a really pleasure to be here again and remember the old days. So. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and for this opportunity to present a review of uh, the perturbation theory, uh, perturbative calculation, and why precision physics is important or why is it interesting. And I will take one example from my calculations to elaborate how we do it and what is the impact. So that is the more or less summary of my talk. So. To proceed, let's start with a generic motivation, and this motivation is going to be long for like around 19, 20 pages, but let's try to motivate you. So we study fundamental interactions, and to understand the nature, the nature of all the fundamental particles, and for that, what we have done, we have a mathematical formulation, which we call the standard model. So we have the Lagrangian with all the particle contents, and that should describe our understanding of the nature, at least three of the forces that we know. But that is the theory part. How we know that this is correct? So to prove our theory, we have experiments, they are particle colliders. And in the colliders, what do we do? We collide particles, for example, protons. Once we collide particles, they produce new states, we measure them, and we, co we compare with our theory calculation. And these comparisons, so the comparison between the prediction of the standard model, that is the theory part, and the collider data, that gives a precise estimate of all the parameters in our Lagrangian, that is the masses and coupling constants. So that is the overall picture, that we have theory and we have experiment, we compare and we get our predictions. So beyond that, we know that there is some new physics out there. Why? Because we cannot explain many things like the origin of electric symmetry breaking or why there is a mass with neutrino and existence of dark matter, you know. All these things we cannot explain within the premises of the standard model. So that means there is something out there and we are looking for it for a long time. But after two wonderful runs of the LIC and the discovery of the Higgs boson, the standard model still is very much verified, but we cannot find any hint of the new physics beyond the standard model. So what to do now? Well, that even the new physics is out there, we know that, that to find it out, we ha need to have a really small distortions from large standard model backgrounds. So it's hiding under these standard model backgrounds. So that means we need to be very precise. So whatever we are measuring, we have to measure more precisely. Whatever we are computing, we have to compute more precisely. And probably there, in the large distortion, we can find a small hint of BSM physics. So 
let's look at how can how precision can help us and how it helped us in the past so for example let's consider before the discovery of the higgs boson that point we had some experiment like from lhc and lep2 and lep1 and we have we had some uh, exclusion plots for higgs so we measured mt and mw and from that we could exclude a large region and say that higgs cannot be with that mass so if you can see the plot that yellow region is excluded by the lhc and the blue was the region where the Higgs can be there from left to antivatron. So it was quite indicative that the Higgs must lie within this green region that is between 114 and something like 130. And that was quite an amazing prediction even to imagine that we don't, did not do anything about Higgs but we could constrain Higgs mass from there. And later on of course in 2012 we, made, we discovered Higgs with this mass. So you can see that the power of the precision. If we make a precision calculation, we can uh, make such uh, confirmed uh, measurement. Okay, let's take another case. Again, with the Higgs boson, and we know that uh, this discovery of the Higgs boson was one of the most important uh, discovery in the last decade, and we used NLO QCD corrections for that. We'll come to that later. What does it mean? But this is the NLO QCD correction. So that means it has taken two orders of precision here in the blue line and you see that these are the experimental data. Now if you look that only if we had taken the leading order term that is here. So we could never say that that is the standard model Higgs because our data is here if you take leading order curve this line is here so we would say that there is something else which is giving us some new numbers. So that says how much these contributions are you can imagine that a low corrections is like 16 and everything else takes you from 16 to here around 49. So without these corrections we could never say that this is our standard model Higgs boson we would go in the wrong way. Okay, so then what is the present need for precision? Of course, here if you go, you say that NNLO is good enough. How do you know that whether NQLO is needed or where? Is it okay? So, which up to which order we should take? That is another question. I cannot ask or that I need 10 digits or like a millionth order of precision. So, where to stop? That is also one thing. So, we should compare our experiment with our theory and both should be equally precise. Like the precision we are getting from our experiment, we should reach from theory perspective to that precision. That should be our goal. Let us come back to the electric precision observable again and try to understand it. So, for example, if you look at the uh, W boson propagators, they have these corrections. Okay, these are corrections and this contain a quark loop with a top and a bottom and then this can be Higgs, so so on. And you can understand that after computing this, the result should depend on three parameters, MW, MZ of course and then also other parameters will be there which is precisely measured but then there should be M top and M Higgs. So what we can do, we can, we have measurement for all of them and we can plot using this and we have some overlap here. Now if in these measurements we have errors, these are given by these errors. If we re reduce these errors, for example this uh, delta MW we have around 19 MeV here, if we reduce it there are two possibilities, either they will overlap or they will not. If they overlap that means this equation is perfect, so this equality holds. If they do not, which should happen at some point. If they do not, then that means this equation, this equality is not holding. So, th this is unequal. That means you need another contributions from some BSM physics to make it equal. If so, to make the overlap again. Okay. So, once we measure this very precisely, that will give us the hint of BSM. So, we can say that here is our BSM physics. Now what is that? That depends on the BSM model but that is the next part. First we have to find whether there is BSM or not and where to find it. Okay. So another comment I can say that because it is going to be in di this direction, we are going to consider Delian process and 
and we are we want to measure MW very precisely. So why Z boson production is important for MW is that MW is extracted from the uh, ch uh, charge current relion, but for that we have a problem. We cannot really account for the missing AT coming from the neutrino. So what we need actually we need the lepton PT and also PT from the W to account for that and PTW is basically can be extrapolated from PTZ because Z production and W production both are equivalent from the QCD perspective. So that's why Z production is very important to measure MW very precisely. Okay, so with that those small motivation let's have a bigger picture that we are going to have some good um, colliders for example Hylium LAC or FCC or um, this ion collider. So all of them, for all of them what, which processes should get, how much precision. Like if we consider a core process like a Higgs production or a Delian production. So for those processes in those future colliders we need precision below 1 percent. Okay, so then you have to think about up to which order to compute. So this below 1 percent means per mill level at least then you need at least 3 loop orders. And then, uh, then you co can consider complex processes like multiple production TT bar H or triple W, so triple vector boson. So for all these processes, of course, these colliders will give, will have uncertainty, st statistical uncertainty. For example, around two percent. So then I I need only an analog QCD for these cases. So th thus you can consider that for which process, how much precision we need. And then also we need to do the summation for several kinematical regions and then also similar process is also needed for other things like non perturbative effects and accurate predictions for BSM effects also then Pattard Sowers, Monte Carlo event generators to compare with the data but these I will not be talking today. So let us consider in one of the process and how to obtain the precision for that. Okay. So, we are quite uh, interested to get all the precisions, but what are the difficulties? What holds us to obtain the most precise result? Okay, this summarizes it. So that's a typical collider picture where we have incoming protons, they're colliding. When they collide, we have basically high energy scattering, which is uh, which is given by all this multi-loop. Uh, calculations or the partonic cross sections and once you have the production of some particles then either you have some bosonic productions or some coax and gluons which finally hadronize and gives you Zs. So each step from starting from this scattering amplitude or getting the uh, getting the coax and gluons from from the proton that is the through PDFs that is one then the scattering amplitudes then hadronization everything is complex all all calculations are very very difficult so each steps one needs to perform for every every steps needs to be performed to finally obtain a good number okay so let's see it in words that first from theory we we have a we do not have a concrete theory which relates our long to short distance physics so that means we quite don't know that very well uh, how to relate or how to get a single quark or gluon from a proton. So of course there are works going on but then we have a PDF a pattern distribution functions which is kind of a probability which tells us that what is the probability to get a quark or gluon from a proton. But that depends on our scattering amplitude cross section and a fit with the experimental data. Okay. Then comes to the scattering amplitudes which has many problems that perturbation theory is our only rigorous tool we cannot compute it exactly. So that means we have all the orders then the strong coupling constant which is not very small. So that means we need to compute few orders at least because it is not very small so perturbation theory should converge after few orders and then there are infinities like ultraviolet and infinite divergences. So they pose many problems which basically do not allow us to compute it through using computers only and then there are unphysical scales because of our theoretical structures the generation factors and scales which which needs to be summed to all orders basically to get rid of them. So they are there in our calculations. So all these problems 
actually makes um, a threshold for our calculation. So everything needs to be overcome. And also once you compute the scattering amplitudes, uh, you need to uh, appropriately sum them to get infrared safe observables and uh, also then radius and jets and partons hours and then you have to match after doing the Monte Carlo simulations to match with the experimental data. So okay, there are lots of complexities involved, but at the moment we can uh, consider only this part. Okay. So let us consider a core process. So wide relian, I mean this is one of the standard process we all learn in our um, classes that and also this is this has large cross section and very clean experimental signature. So it is very important for calibrating the detectors and also constraining all the PDFs. So the PDFs as I said, I mean they are fit. So for that you need a process which is a, like um, standard candle process to use it to compute the PDF and use it for other processes. So that is why Trillian is very important. On the other hand, it involves the precise uh, predictions for uh, different electric parameters like W zone mass and with mixing angle and so on. So that is and also some new physics process can mimic the final steps. So instead of here a Z boson, you can have a Z prime or something else which can produce the same leptonic states. So that is why this can mimic the same final states, so it can be there. That is why there, there has been lot of work for uh, the Drillian production, lot of work I mean for lot of corrections incorporated. So recently there has been the NQ electricity was done by this group and this correction was like around 0.5 percent in NQ QCD. And now very recently uh, there has been re really good motivation to compute this part. I will explain later what this part is, wh what does NLO QCD electric means, but let us uh, look, uh, look at uh, all these um, recent literatures which has been done and my talk is based on basically these two literature. Okay. So before I explain what does, sorry, before I explain what does this uh, NNLO QCD electric means, let us understand the uh, pattern model again. So we have two protons colliding and Fs gives us the probability of getting a quark or a gluon out of this proton. So once we have a quark or gluon, then they interact and that is the scattering amplitude what you compute to obtain some Z boson. Okay, that is the basic structure. So this this is the large long distance physics and that is the short distance physics or high energy physics. So you can write down in this convolution form where this is a probability of getting the first pattern from the first proton and this is the second one. Okay, and this is our patternic cross section. And this hadronic cross section is total and the patternic cross section that is what we compute in perturbation theory. So this contains all the loops or all the perturbation order for this computation. Okay. So in the full QCD electric standard model, how many expansion parameter we have? We have two, one is the strong coupling constant and the electric coupling constant or the fine structure constant. So alpha s and alpha. So of course you can expand as I said, this can be expanded perturbatively, you have expansion in alpha s and alpha both. So to start with there will be a leading order process which may depend on any order on alpha, but that is the leading order and then there can be corrections on top of that. So one more alpha s is the NLO QCD, one more alpha is the NLO electroweak okay. and then there can be alpha square which is NNLO QCD, so two loop in QCD and then you can have alpha alpha s of course which should be the NNLO QCD electroweak. And this is what the target of this talk. So we want to compute this. Now why we want to compute this? So why is this 1 1 is important? Okay. So first point very naively if we look at value of alpha s which changes but naively it is like 0 0.1 and alpha is like 0 0.007, 0 0.01. So you can say naively that alpha square is same as alpha. So very basic power counting. Okay. So if we cons compute alpha s cube, that means it is almost same as alpha s alpha. 
that is the first point from naive power counting right the contribution from alpha s cube should be same as alpha s alpha and that should be per mil contribution so that's why both the contributions should be taken okay and okay this it's not working okay so now second point is that that we have seen for NLO electric corrections there are large logs so there are logs of MW over some scale and if you go to the really large scale this MW can become is small compared to the scale so the log contribution is really large and these are called Sudaka blobs logs and one needs to resum them and we all know that NLO QCD correction is really higher comparatively to NLO. So if we take NLO electroweak on top of that, if you take a QCD correction, that should be high, really high. So that's why these mixed corrections are really important on top of NLO electroweak. On the other hand, if you take QCD corrections, that control because of NQLO, we have computed third order already. So that control all the uncertainties from the unphysical scales, but they lack all these effects from large electroweak. So we have two uh, road. So one is QCD, which controls the unphysical scales, but that doesn't control the logs coming from the mass, the pseudocop logs. We have electroweak that controls the pseudocop logs, but not the uh, uncertainties from the unphysical scales. So that's why the mixed one, which will control both. That's why it is so important. Okay. So to summarize, this has similar magnitudes as an QCD and contains the large electric effects like electric correction, reduce the theoretical uncertainties from the unphysical scales like QCD corrections. Okay, we, and there is another motivation which is electric scheme dependence. So let me explain it also a little bit. So in our Lagrangian, we have mainly three inputs, right? G, G prime and V, the fave. But we have observables like Fermi constant, then strong coupling constant, uh, sorry, electric uh, constant and MW, MZ, sin theta W. So all of them are measured in various experiments and the, all of them we know very precisely. So which one to use? There is no guideline that I have to use this, so I can choose any. I have to choose three of them, but I can choose any. So what people can do, there is GMU scheme. Okay. This is GMU scheme where you choose GMU MWMZ as input. So use all the relations among GMU alpha and sin theta w to compute alpha and sin theta w. So GMU MWMZ are our input. Everything else, else is computed from their value. And their values are numbers coming from the experiments. Or I can choose alpha zero scheme where alpha MWMZ are considered as inputs. But then G mu and sin theta w are, are computed using their numbers. So in principle, whatever I take, I should get the same result. This doesn't happen. Why? Because we have a relation relating G mu and alpha. And these relations gets some corrections delta r, which you saw earlier with the through the loops. And these loops gets corrections only electric, no QCD correction first and then mixed correction. So that starts with the electric correction. So if you consider QCD corrections only, you, your delta R is always zero because you are not going to that order in alpha. Okay. So that means if you compute alpha through experiment and if you compute alpha using this uh, equation through the experimental value of GMU, these two alphas are different. And this difference is 3.53 percent which is quite large. Now you compute any QCD corrections you can't get rid of this because you are put this delta r is 0 for QCD correction. So that's why it's a major flaw in our schemes that we you choose a different scheme and you get a very different result. And let's do an example you see that I have taken NLO electric here and this difference goes away because now delta r has some value so this alpha and the experimental value of alpha comes closer, which it should be. And so the difference goes up to 0.53. Now what I do, I add delta 1, 0, which is the QCD part. And again, this difference rises because I have the QCD one loop correction for which this delta R is not there. So that's why I need here this uh, mixed correction, which will control it. Okay, so this is another motivation. So 
with that let me start first part of my talk which is uh, the inclusive production of z boson so this is a fully analytic computation of an inclusive cross section so what does it mean it means that this is a quark a z boson is produced that that's the bond multiplied conjugate and this is our channel so qq bar to production of a z and what can happen i can have loops here a gluon and a photon or a z boson so that's the virtual correction and you see that it is order alpha s and alpha then what i can have i can have a real emission now this real emission is again order alpha square total alpha s so it's like the same corrections of virtual but then i have to i have to consider all the contributions from all moment of this emission of the photon so that will contribute to the inclusive production of the z pro z production so inclusive means z plus anything z plus x okay also same for the double real so i can have two emissions like two quarks and i have to integrate over the phase space of this okay so once we do this this or all these things will give us a full nlo contribution to inclusive z boson production so that's why so that's the difference between inclusive and exclusive maybe i explain it a bit more this is a one loop okay but if you consider the process qq bar to z plus gamma then it is one loop qcd correction however if you consider all gammas with all momenta that means you are summing all the gammas with all momenta and that is integrating over the phase space of gamma that gives you the production of z boson so that is the inclusive so you integrate over the phase space okay and so for loop integrals which is widely studied and results are in constants but the phase space integrals they are often performed numerically but what we are going to do we are also going to compute this phase space integrals analytically and these integrals should be in terms of poly logarithms so you know logs logarithms and you also know poly logarithms right poly logarithms is like some integral over some kernel on the logs so gpls are like a generalized form of those poly logs so now the question comes how to compute the feynman integral or feynman diagrams so that's a really summarized uh, procedure to compute a generic um, feynman diagram we we go through using diagrammatic approach so that means we first the generate the feynman diagrams which is of the order of 100 or 1000 depending on the process and you know feynman diagrams means what you have the feynman rules feynman rules contains lorentz index dirac index and so on that you know so you have to do all this manipulation lorentz algebra dirac algebra kala algebra and so on so once you have that you have done this manipulations you only have some scalar products in the denominator and some propagators in the numerator and if you have phase space integrals which we are talking about you can use this property of the delta function which is called reverse unitarity to write them down in difference of two propagator looking form so basically again if you have phase space integrals you can write them in terms of propagators okay so once you have that this is a really nice idea to write them in terms of integral families so what are they they are like a generalization of a diagram and you try to incorporate as many diagrams as possible into those particular names or generalizations once you do that you have some propagators and you have some dot products now if you imagine a one loop uh, case there are like three propagators and the independent dot products are three so you can write all the dot products in terms of the propagators so then beforehand before doing so you had some Uh, dot products in the denominators which you have written all of them in terms of propagators so you will not have anything in the denominator just one and the propagators will have some powers so this is a really nice idea which decompose all these 
scalar integrals with dot products to the scalar integrals with denominator 1. But there will be like million of such integrals and it is impossible to do by them by hand. But there are some identity relations. What are those? These are called integration by parts identities. This is nothing but taking the idea that in dimensional regularization all integrals are well behaved. So, if that is true then you can go to the boundary of any integral and boundary the integral should be 0. So, you can form a integral for with work with any integral you make a derivative you integrate that is the boundary term and that should be 0 and that will give you millions of again relations. Like you have millions integrals so you can do these things for all of them and then you have million of relations. So, you can just solve all these relations. So, it is just like we have a new unknowns these are nu and then we have nr relations. So, that means this number is only independent and this independent numbers is really really small compared to million we have 10 to 100. Now, these ones we call the master integrals and we can solve them using some other technique. Then how to solve them? It is called method of differential equation. Just to summarize again, these objects are Feynman integrals. Whatever they are, they are functions of something. They are functions of our Mandelstam variables, nothing else. Once you do the integration, but let us not do the integration. I have the Mandelstam variables, I can differentiate that integral with respect to my variable, that I can do. Once I do, it becomes a different integral, but use this trick that any integral can be written in terms of our masters. This is like rotating an integral and again projecting to our coordinates, Th that trick I can do always. So, we have a basis, we rotate this basis and we project it to the basis again. So, that means we get a system, a matrix, right. So, this matrix you can solve because what we did, we differentiated with respect to our uh, Mandelstam variable. So, it is a first order differential equation, I get a matrix. So, basically coupled differential equation, so I can solve it given a boundary condition. So, once I have the boundary condition, I can solve the whole matrix and all my master integrals are solved. Okay. Of course, one we, once we solve this, we need to perform all this renormalization of the all fields and couplings. And then we know that we also have infrared singularities. Now, this is a first case where we are computing the inclusive production and for this, what happens? We have KLN theorem, which I will discuss later that we sum all degenerate states and followed by appropriate mass factorization which cancels all the infrared singularities for this case. Once we have done this, we have a finite Quaternic cross section, then we use our pattern model which we showed earlier to convolute with PDFs and that gives us a total hadronic cross section for the jet person production. Okay. So, this is the generic procedure for this one. Again, just to recap that we have this like pure virtual two loop diagrams, one real emission, so that means one delta function here, phase space, two real emission, so that means two delta function here. And we performed all the algebras, we reduced all the Feynman integral set of masters and we used the method of differential equation to compute all the masters. So, that is the three steps major. And then we performed UV renormalization and IR. So, all the soft gluons and photons and all final state collinear singularities, they cancel when all degenerate states are sum. So, when this gluon is soft, that cannot be distinguished from a gluon emitting from here, because it is soft. Okay. So, this is like uh, degenerate states. So, that is why when you sum them all together, all these soft singularities will go away except from the initial state collinear singularities which are absorbed by mass factorization the alta liparisi spreading kernels. Okay. So, how to do the ultraviolet renormalization? You know we have a quark field. So, we need to renormalize the quark field. We have so that is how you can do it and then we have the vertex which you need to renormalize and you need to also renormalize the Z boson propagator Z boson field. So, this together is be finite and thanks to the background field gauge. Normally, this all together should be finite, but if you use this background field gauge which separates the UV finiteness. Okay. And as I discussed the cancellation of the infrared divergences, 
that the initial state collinear divergence is remain once we sum all of them and that is uh, that is absorbed through the mass factorization. Okay. And finally, I come to my result and this uh, this is the fifth this is the final number of the total corrections and you see that we have some like per mil correction but more importantly that now the scheme dependence has come to 0.23 which is small and you see the importance of these corrections now that first it has the per mil effect which we want and also the this has been reduced so this has been done using uh, this Lux QED PDF. So, what does it mean? Let us go to the next slide. So, in proton, we can consider that proton contains only quarks and gluons, or I can also consider the proton contains photon. Now, these two are different model. So, only QCD or QCD with photon, QCD QED. These two are different model, ok. Now, which model is correct? Now, if you do this QCD, then we have a number, and if you do this QCD QED, then we have another number. Now, uh, these numbers are differed by this, which should not be. I mean, you take two different models, but this differs. Why should it happen? Because this calculation was not done beforehand, so this QCD QED PDF does not contain or is not fit considering this calculation because it was not done. So, once this is done, I think, I mean, this will go down anyway, but then the question comes, uh, which model one should take? I mean, this is to understand that both models are legitimate, but uh, the QCD electric model is more logical choice because photons also can come from the proton. Okay. So, this is the first part, maybe I, I if you have any questions now. Okay, then I go to the next part where we consider the full Drillian production. So, what does it mean if you look at the um, right hand side, I do not know which side, uh, okay, this side, uh, this is the Z boson production, right? A Z boson is produced and then it decays decays to two leptons, so it is the double virtual to the Drillian and then there can be diagrams where this is not, this does not look like a Z boson production. Here is also same, you can have emission and Z boson can decay. So, these three pieces can be computed as we did earlier, the same thing, but these three pieces cannot be done in that way because they are much more complicated. So, the analytical calculation is much more complicated for this part. So, here we use a different technique. So, what is the problem? The problem is that all of them are divergent as we saw. This contains soft and collinear, all of them divergences and we have to get rid of them and the only way to get rid of them or not get rid of them, they cancel is when we sum all of them. But we cannot do it here because it is too complicated. So, there is another way called subtraction technique. What does it mean? That we add something here and subtract something here, so that this is finite and this is finite and then the, they are related by this. So, this divergent structure is universal. I can compute this universal structure I 1 1 and this is also the counter term is also universal. What is the difference here? That to reach from I 1 1 from the counter term, one should do the phase space integral, which exactly we were doing in the earlier case earlier case we were doing this integral, but here it is difficult. So, that is why we have a counter term. So, once you have the counter term, we have the universal structure and they are related by this, we can compute each of them and both all of them will be finite. So, each piece part A and part B we can compute and we add all the finite pieces. Okay, that is the very basic idea of the subtraction. So, you subtract something, you add the same thing back with a constant. So, okay, now I am going to, so once, sorry, it is not going back. So, for this case, now we are going to concentrate on here because that is the most complicated part. For this case, you can use any uh, one loop generators to compute all these diagrams now because this you do not have to integrate out anymore. 
So, for this case we have two problems ultraviolet divergences and infrared divergences. So, in ultraviolet divergences again uh, using the same technique we have the quark field which gets the renormalization, we have the lepton field which also should be renormalized and also vertices. The same way one can renormalize all the fields and parameters. For the infrared divergences, now we can separate out or we can find out the universal structure. So, just to give you an idea that suppose uh, this there is an emission something like that k plus p, k is the momentum of the gluon, then k0 can be very small the energy of the gluon which gives you divergence and that is called soft divergence or this theta can be 0. <coughs> so, giving you collinear divergence. So, the gluon can emit along this line. Okay. So, these two kind of divergence can appear. Now, in our case, uh, okay. so in our case, yeah. so this gluon can be soft or this can be collinear or you can have an emission here. But fortunately, these divergence structures are universal. What you can do? You can write down any amplitude and you can factor out all the collinear pieces which are called z function, all the soft function, soft pieces containing soft divergences and once you can factor out this factorization is happens whatever left is the called hard function and these two are universal and hard function depends on process to process. Because of this universality one can write down the subtraction operator. So, once you know j for each leg, you can write for any number of legs. Once you know the soft function, you know you can write it down. So, one can write down the uh, subtraction operators which is just a combination of z function and soft function for this case. Okay. And once we do that, we can obtain, we can compute the amplitude, we can do the subtraction in this way and we obtain the hard function and these are finite. And this is what we do for this case for the virtual piece. Again the computation procedure is same except that there is no phase space integral now. So, we do not do any reverse unitarity, but uh, we draw the diagrams we perform all the algebraic manipulation and this is what I was talking about the integral families. For example, if you have a scalar product here you can write this scalar product in terms of propagators like this and you see that L square cancels L square it becomes like this this cancels this it becomes this and p square is there which is a constant this gives you this. So, we had an integral here this that is a pure one loop example simple example, but it contains some dot products here for two loop it is much more complicated. And now we are rid of all the dot products in the denominator which makes the integral simple and then we again use all the IBP identities to write in terms of master integrals and now to we have to compute the master integrals. Now, we can use the method of differential equation which I was saying, but here we also use another approach and why is that? Let us recap a bit what we are doing. We are computing Feynman integrals which looks like this and using differential equation we have written the results in terms of logarithms polylogs. Now, what is polylog? Polylog is an iterated integral. So, you have 1 over x, you integrate 1 over x, you get log x, you have 1 over 1 minus x, you integrate 1 over 1 minus x with log x, you get a polylog and you keep doing from L i 2, you get L i 3, polylog 3, polylog 4, so on. So, you integrate iteratively and that is why it is called iterated integrals. So, that is what we did using differential equation. We had a Feynman integral, we obtained some functions, but this is still an integral. So, then you doubt what is the gain? what do we gain from here? The point is that this Feynman integrals are multi dimensional I mean with d dimension and it is very much complicated the numerical evaluation is tedious and really unstable and really imprecise. So, that is why we go here these iterated integrals are one dimensional logs and polylogs they are one dimensional. So, they can be computed with great precision and very short time. So, there are few algebras which allow this polylog to reduce to a basis. So, that means you can write all such functions into few and you once evaluate this few you are done and also there are scaling invariants. So, this can be used to make them very precise. So, 
and the example how one polylog looks like this. I mean, this is a one dimensional integral, right? 1 over t and 1 over 1 minus x. But unfortunately, for the two loop case, not all of them looks like this. There are things where this 1 minus x is replaced by a square root. Now, what happens when we have a square root? You have mostly these things are computed in Euclidean region, but our interested region is to go to the Minkowski. And that point, the square root contains a minus. So that means you have to do an analytic continuation. And that is very, very difficult. Because for each, each function, you have to do it, and there are many functions such that. So it is very challenging. So the question is, can we find a different approach, which is better than this? So to find it, let us ask ourselves that what do we need from the two-loop amplitude? What are we looking for? So we are looking for first an analytic formula for the singular part because we have some large terms minus some large terms and we really love to see a cancellation to see a zero out of this so the singular part we want completely analytic and that we can get what we can do we can write down all this uh, differential equation and we can find out some combinations so some tricks we can use that is giving us results in terms of GPLs, so that is solved. So one problem is solved. Now what we are left with the finite part, which of course we cannot solve this way, that is why we come here. But what we need for the finite part, a formula which should be numerically stable and precise, that is what we need. So what we do, we take the differentially of the master integrals and we solve using series expansion, but not just normal Laura series expansion. We do the series expansion at each space time point using an algorithm. So if we want a value at some x, y, z point, we go there, we perform a series expansion, solve it. And then you understand that if you have a series expansion there up to any order, you can get precision up to any order. So that's why it is so beautiful. And the good thing about this approach that that can be easily generalized to more complicated process. For processes which involves functions which do not even understand, like you, if you heard of elliptic polylogs that we don't understand that well. So for that, those cases we can perform this for each phase space point we can evaluate this series and we have a very precise result which is our final goal, ultimate goal. So this opens up the possibility to reach very good accuracy or precision in theoretical calculation. Okay, so finally I come to my results. So that is a different perturbative contributions for the fiducial cross section. Fiducial means we have put some cuts on the PTZ and something. And you see that this is the final corrections and this is even larger than NN allocuity. That is something surprising. Of course, this depends on this fiducial cuts, whatever cut we are putting. But fiducial cross sections are much better compared to the total cross section because that can be directly compared with experiments because experimentalists also can put cuts that okay I don't want PT of the Z uh, less than some 15 GB or something like that that you can put and experimentalists can put and you can easily compare and here you see that the QCD corrections are much smaller compared to the this correction so this is quite large and big and important. And then also you can see the inverted mass distribution. So for the lower energy limit, this also of course doesn't matter. But for the high energy, we see that there are effects, and uh, these effects are quite large. So when we go to high Lumière LHC, these corrections will play a very important role. Okay. So few concluding remarks. So precision physics like current front of particle physics. If we need to find any BSM, we must be precise from both experiment and theory. And our current understanding is constrained by the perturbative nature and hence we have to compute all of them in perturbative correction. So precision measurement of electric parameters like MW and sin theta W, they are sensitive to BSM physics and that is why the mixed corrections is going to be a, you know, going to play a very important role in these measurements. And then the last thing, our semi-analytic approach has opened the possibilities to compute more difficult but very important processes which is going to be next. And okay, so this is the same thing in summarized that phenological uh, importance is there but then I also would like to uh, 
uh, say that mathematically is also very important because once we are trying to compute this we are facing new functions or new techniques can be used for that so like graph theory etc people are using it and so there is a natural synergy with mathematics so one needs to work and find all the mathematical structures to success here in the computation and then computational part also I mean all these calculations are big and you need the computer to do it for you and then you need to write sophisticated computer programs and this can be used not only here but also in different uh, in different physics like people have used for some gravitational wave physics computation, condensed matter physics and also supersymmetric theories. So there is a first use of these computer programs. So I would say I will conclude by saying that this is the very interesting time to do precision physics. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Narayan, for this very comprehensive review, and we are open for questions. Uh, this uh, this uh, controversial new uh, W mass measurement. Uh, so, how much will it? If you use if you use that as an input, how much will it shift your uh, Rayleigh results by? I mean, is it well, of the order of the size of this correction, or will it be much that, more? That than we are uh, we have to do it now. So, what we have to do? We have to take our result, uh -huh. put in a Monte Carlo. Huh. And, com and do this analysis for okay. LAC data. Huh. But that's going, we are going to do at some point and it needs time. Mm -hmm. But to, to compare with the Tevatron, first we have to understand what they are using, like they're using response and the PDFs they are using. Mm -hmm. So these things also we need to get yeah, to yeah. compare. Okay. So okay. I think. So you don't have a feeling for how much it will shift? No, it? without doing it, it's difficult to say. Okay. So my second question was about ILC physics. So there it's, you know, because, because it's ILC, uh, you, I mean, you'll have your QED corrections, and then you'll have your QED QCD corrections, which will come at the same order as your higher order. So yes. is that the kind of stuff you're planning to do? What is it that you're actually planning to apply to uh, ILC? Uh, so far. Because I don't think anyone has looked at QED QCD corrections for ILC. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to be important, and yeah, there is exactly. no such difference in using this. Like it's all techniques. So yeah. So I'm saying. So uh, can, can you use some of these results into your ILC? I mean. Yeah, you can in principle use some of the results for them TT bar form factors. Yeah. Okay. So these you can use, okay. and we are also planning to. I mean to convert them. So you have to appropriately convert them. You have to change the color factors. You have to yeah. do the abelianization. All these things you have to do. But it is uh, possible yeah, yeah, to because, convert because them. Because had this thing about how to pick out the, you know, I mean, remove the color factors. Essentially, the reverse process you have to do, right? Yes, yes. exactly. So you don't have gluons there. So uh, that you have con right. should be converted yeah, okay. to photons. And all these things you have to do I properly. See. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very Thank nice you. talk. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, can you just summarize the, how the theory remains uh, renormalized in the ultraviolet uh, region? Uh, can you just uh, say in the in sigma one one case? Mm -hmm. So, how the theory will be renormalized in the ultraviolet case? Uh, can you just okay? Uh, yeah. So, you see that uh, I can take this example. So, you have a Q Q bar going to a Z boson and then L plus L minus. So what are the fields you have quark fields so that means the quark fields should get a renormalization what does it mean you think about a quark line and then there can be a z boson as a loop and this gives you the first electroic correction and then you can have a gluon that will give you alpha alpha s correction to the quark line similarly for left on line now left on line there is no gluon so you see there will be only electric correction I mean, you cannot attach a gluon to lepton, right? So it's only electroic one loop. There will not be any one-one correction for that. Then you have this 
vertex. So vertex is more involved, complicated for this part because it contains all this E and V. And for these propagators, I can say that this Z boson propagator, now we can consider a quark here or a W here. So this will give you one loop or first order in electric. And then this quark, whichever, there can be a gluon attached, right? That will give you alpha alpha S. And the uh, uh, infrared renormalization, renal, so mm -hmm. there will be uh, the soft gluon case. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is it, uh, so it cannot, it, it cannot be detected, right? Uh, so, it is external gluon, uh, it the soft gluon that is emitted, mm -hmm. it is external. Uh, it is external. So, the soft gluon can be in the loop here. Mm -hmm. This gluon also can be yes, soft. Yes, Or the emission, what you see, that also can be soft. Now, in this case, it is a bit different, right? We are using a subtraction. So that means this soft part or the all the infrared parts are there. We are not sub, we are not cancelling it yet. So to cancel it, we have written down the universal structure. Now this universal structure is called universal because with knowing what are the final state particles and what is inside, with that information you can write it down. Okay, once you write down, this should cancel whatever you are getting from your computation. And that happens. So this together gives you a finite piece. And then this together gives you a finite piece. But remember that only calculating this, getting a finite piece is not the number because here you can add plus something and minus something always. A constant can be added and subtract and thus it can be wrong. And so that's why this together makes a sense. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, maybe I'm understanding it incorrectly, but when you said like uh, uh, the Feynman integrals, the loop, loop integrals, uh, they are iterative integrals over loop momenta. So, you s the, when you mentioned like you are solving them using series expansions, hmm. uh, like is is it? Uh, how do you control like prop error propagation? Like if you calculate something which is indent, like which is iterative, hmm. like s if you calculate some first integral which is like the most inside integral and there is some fine error in that like cal in calculating that. maybe can i write down here yeah yeah you can so, so how job? like what do you have do you have to do to yeah like, i understand that shock is Okay, then maybe we go to the slide. Yeah, I don't have this slide. Can I try to change slide? Maybe. Okay, I have a, one more slide. I can try to see if. maybe it can help let's see okay this is what we are talking about right this is a Feynman integral okay and you can write down like this and uh, using the IVP identities the, okay this is the IVP identity and then you have the recursion relation relating n plus 1 to n so you can write all integrals of n equal to 1 2 3 4 in terms of i n Okay, that's one thing we do, and yeah. Okay, now I think this one I have. Thank you. Yes. So, and then we want to solve this integral. Okay, now this is one particular integral which is a function of the dimension and z. 
right? What I do, I do the differential with respect to z, and then I solve it. So with respect to z, then which will be some combination of integrals, use the IBP identities, which looks like this, and which finally will look like this. So I have n integrals, n of them I differentiate, I should get some coefficients here in terms of n. So that's the matrix. Of course, it is difficult to solve. So what we hope for and it happens is that it looks like a block diag diagonal form. So you start solving from here. Okay. Now this is what dz zn equals to some constant zn. Okay. I should hope. Yeah. And this should look like this. Okay. Now once you try to solve it, you can do in two ways. One is exactly solving it or expanding this in terms of z minus z0 where z0 is your point. You have a boundary condition at say some point, you start with that boundary condition, you go to the nearest point, you solve it for that and you have a series expansion. Now the error is controlled by you, like you want I like 30 digit. So you compute for series, 100 digit series, 100 numbers in the order and then you see that 30 and 31st digit I mean you can understand how much error is there then you apply only 30 digit I need then you proceed for the next point this is how you control like this is how you control the error like yeah so uh, I mean this is under fully control I mean how many orders I need yeah okay. how many digits I need I say that and then it's automatically okay, controlled okay. yeah because and, uh, there are some tricks here so of course there are poles how to avoid these poles so this I did not discuss here but of course there are poles and near poles you have to be careful you have to consider the log expansion or not so these are other things okay but this is total control okay thanks Thank uh, so Naran, let me ask you one question so yeah, sure. you have this uh, difference equations Mm. Uh, master uh, equations mm. that you mentioned, right? Mm. So these are kind of difference equations, right? Yes. So what are the uh, fixed points of it, right? If you have a difference equation, you, uh, mm. it, have, it could have fixed points. So what does this signify? Or is it relevant in this kind of problem? Uh, or do they have like a fixed point kind of thing, uh, structure? So, so you mean this one, right? No, sorry. So once I have this, I can yeah, write down gen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have the difference equation, and this uh, difference equation should contain. Yeah, I don't think there is any importance for the fixed point. We never taken. And the only place we we are we are interested is that this all the difference equation solves all the coefficients mm -hmm. in terms of only one coefficient. Mm -hmm. So these coefficients you can choose arbitrarily for the moment, keep it as a parameter mm -hmm. and later when you are matching with the boundary condition you can just compare with that. And if you go to higher orders in perturbation theory, mm -hmm. then these form of differential equations change. Yes, Difference of course, equation. of course. You're not not even higher order. You consider a different mm -hmm. topology; it changes. And there is no way to predict, like if we have up truncate up to a fixed order, and then if you want to go to higher order, mm -hmm. is there a way to guess like how the difference equation will look like? There are ways. Uh, if you know the integral family or topology, okay. you can guess what kind of so again this uh, coefficient are basically the weights mm -hmm. and that you can guess from the topology so wh what kind of uh, kernels are going to appear okay. so that is possible oh, so then there is a systematic program to like there is a systematic program so you can guess what are the cuts and things can come yeah okay thank you oh differential differential <laughs> No, uh, so differential equation is this one, but then I can write Jn as sum of Cg, Cn, some something. That. That it is still a function of z, no? The coefficients. It's not uh, your. Uh, it is still a function of uh, z. No, what I can do? I can write this Jn as sum of some other C. CI and say II, something like that. 
and then expand it okay and CIIA in Z to the power I okay this I is also not important CIZ to the power I if I know that it is the expansion in Z to be more generic I can do this Z0 to the power I that Lorentz expansion you put it in the differential equation you have and then you compare with left hand side right hand side all z minus z 0 to the power i coefficients that gives you all the different equations sorry no that depends now if you have a cut then the fixed point won't be zero of course, of course. i mean if you have logs that's why i could not comment but it doesn't matter that much yeah Hmm. So, here you are writing k is equal to from starting from minus 2. So, you are, are you considering a loop, one loop or? Th that's an example for one loop. I mean, that, that's, that's much more details, but okay, yeah, oh. that's right. Yeah. Uh, this question is from a different perspective actually. Which kind of numerical integrators do you use here and are there any numerical bounds to the uh, maximum obtainable precision? No, you don't use any numerical integrator. Okay. Okay. So, first point in the first part what we did? We have this Feynman integration, we have the differential equation method. Finally, it gives you a logs and polylogs. Now, for logs and polylogs to evaluate them, how can you evaluate? You can use numerical integrator or again these logs and polylogs are fewer in number you can have a series solution for different points same thing and you can prepare our we can prepare our own set a photon program and this works perfectly fine and that that's very precise and for the second one we have a series solution right so we don't need any numerical integrator yeah because numerical integrator using it there are errors coming from there which we don't want and we don't have which is much better Okay, I don't see any further questions. So thanks, Narayan, again Thank you. for agreeing to give this so nice talk in a very short notice. And I hope you come back again, and we can discuss further in tea and uh, snacks outside.